started. Go. Please join me in the pledge. Pledge allegiance. Supervisors, please uh, press your P and plus for attendance. I see Supervisor Ron Johnson is not here. I'm not aware of um, his absence. So I'm not, uh, trust maybe he may have the uh, time mixed up. We'll see if he shows up. Uh, we are missing Supervisor Clark. There we go, 27 in attendance. All right, this is, uh, we've got a couple of meetings here this evening. The first is the public hearing on the budget. First order of business will be uh, citizens' comments. I will point out that uh, citizens should, if there's a number of you willing to, or looking to speak, please cue to the microphone. Be prepared to uh, move quickly to the microphone if you would. You will have five minutes to address the board. And I would ask that you state your name and address before uh, beginning to speak. So at this point in time, citizen comments are open. I guess I'll go first. Uh, Jim Huff, 3212 22nd Avenue. Like what you done with the place? Looks good. Uh, I'd like to speak on the uh, medical examiner's uh, position in the budget uh, this evening. As a former law enforcement officer, I can tell you that uh, from firsthand experience, there's nothing more stressful or traumatic than a death investigation. Whether that death would be by natural causes, suicide, homicide, or uh, means unknown. Uh, and during that difficult time, it's nice to have trained professional personnel from the medical examiner's office to work by our sides. The assistant medical examiner does a, does a preliminary examination of the deceased, and by that determines where that deceased person will go, whether it would be through a, an autopsy to determine cause of death or to a, directly to a funeral home. Uh, the medical examiner and uh, the police have a different function, although the medical examiner uh, has to abide by state statute, by certain policies. They're, more cons they're also concerned with the family, uh, and, and they treat the family and uh, as them, they treat the family first, and they are not working for the funeral homes. During my tenure on the county board and as chairman of the Judiciary and Law Committee, the medical examiner came under the jurisdiction of the Judiciary and Law Committee at one time. It was a priority of this board and previous administrations to make the medical examiner's office more responsive along with more accountable and its budgeting and handling of cases. In 1998, my first year on the county board, the medical examiner handled 486 cases with a total revenue of $22,000. To date in 2010, the medical examiner has 984 cases with a revenue of $170,000. Now in 1998, they had one forensic pathologist and two medical examiner's assistants. Today they have one patholo one patholo pathological like that, one forensic pathologist and three medical assistants. Uh, so anyway, in the past, this board has approved training in the amount of fifteen thousand dollars to those three medical assistants. They are all American Board Medical Legal Death Investigators. They are highly trained and extremely capable. It's now being proposed to outsource the autopsies to Milwaukee to a medical pathologist. The previous medical examiner had a salary of $110,000. The current budget being proposed tonight has several cost shifting items in it. For example, the DA's office added $25,000 in their budget to cover costs associated with the new medical examiner in Milwaukee testifying here in Kenosha. In addition, there's $30,000 in that budget that's in the health department for lab, lab increases. So that's $55,000 between those two if you remove the, remove the $110,000 for the uh, pathologist. If it's still the wish of this board and to outsource the medical examiner's office, uh, the, po the position of the local medical examiner, off a medical examiner, whoever gets that position is going to be highly crucial. The individual will determine the case, what cases are sent to Milwaukee for further examination and which ones can be sent to the funeral homes. I would hope that one of these three individuals that we've trained and are knowledgeable would be eligible for that position. As you know, State Statute 59 places a responsibility to name the medical examiner with the county board, not the county executive. It's not by county appointment, county executive appointment, not by the personnel director, 
You and you alone have that decision as county board supervisors. You appoint the medical examiner. So I would hope you do your due diligence, do some background information about in the event that you do outsource this autopsies to uh, Milwaukee, who's going to run the local office? Thank you for your time. Thank you. Anyone else wishing to speak? Again, I would ask, uh, seeing the crowd, if you would be prepared to speak soon after the next speaker, I'd appreciate it. Yes, sir. I'm Dr. Mark Wittick, current medical examiner. I live at 6826 91st Avenue in Pleasant Prairie. Tonight and tomorrow night are interesting evenings for the Kenosha County Medical Examiner's Office and the entire Kenosha County community. You can turn back the clock 50 years to the time when the coroner knew very little and could do very little. That is what is in the current budget. That is exactly what is there. No matter what anyone else says, that's what you'll be getting. Or <clears throat> you can decide not to throw away over 20 years of progress and retain the current three full-time deputies. These three women are educated. All three are board certified in medical legal death investigation, the highest certification level for their job that they can get. These three have a proven record of success in the office. They know the current standards for investigations, which help the forensic pathologists do the best job possible. If you give me as a forensic pathologist a poor report, don't expect me to be able to answer all the questions. And it doesn't matter whether you're talking about me or Dr. Peterson in Milwaukee, Dr. Bedrisky in Waukesha, or any of the other forensic pathologists. The old computer adage of ego, garbage in, garbage out, works just the same. The good forensic investigations help the families, they help law enforcement, they help to do the judiciary system and the community as a whole. Recycling an old employee who failed the first time around is simply not in the best interest of the office or the community. As a forensic pathologist, I have worked in Wisconsin for over 20 years with coroners and lay medical examiners. I can tell you without doubt that a lay medical examiner system with trained people such as you have in Brown County and in Columbia County can work. And it can work quite well because you have trained people who are board certified in death investigation. One is a fireman with extensive experience as an EMT and paramedic. One is a nurse with sexual assault nurse training specialty. As such, it is my recommendation that you change the budget given to you and retain the three professionals that you already have making the office function very well. I truly believe that that is what is best for the community of Kenosha County now, in the short term, and in the long term. Thank you for your time and attention. Thank you. Anyone else wishing to speak? My name is Brian Peterson, 933 West Highland in Milwaukee. I am the Milwaukee County Medical Examiner. And uh, naturally, I'll be speaking briefly about death investigation. Um, death investigation is kind of like having your teeth cleaned. Nobody wants to do it or think about it, but the more you put it off and the more you scrimp, the worse things will get in the long run. Um, there are specific reasons for that. What does the medical examiner's office do? We determine cause and manner of death. The cause of death is what actually takes somebody away. The manner of death is how the cause arose, homicide, suicide, accident, and so forth. Clearly, at autopsy, our job is to determine cause of death, gunshot wound to the head. The job of the investigators going to the scene, talking to the family, obtaining the history, is to determine manner of death. It could be a suicide, it could be an accident, it could be a homicide. I speak in a way out of enlightened self-interest because the way things are looking now, it may be that our office is doing your autopsies. I think we'll do a good job. We're good at what we do. But our eyes and ears on the ground must be trained because, as Dr. Wittick says, garbage in, garbage out. My preference would be that the staff you have now be retained. They're excellent. I've worked with them off and on over the years, filling in, helping out. They're terrific people. They know what they're doing. 
That's part A, all right? Part B, numbers, all right? Um, in Milwaukee County, I like to say that our office is frugal to the point of parsimony. Um, we know how to, how to shave pennies. We have to in today's budget, I get that. We're all under the same gun. Um, given our population and the number of autopsies that we do, Kenosha County has roughly 15 to 20 percent of our population. If you multiply the numbers out, that would mean that in a county your size, they should be doing between 150 and 200 autopsies a year, all right? If that's not happening, there are cuts being made. That may be okay. But the thing is, if you're making cuts, there are only certain cases that you're not bringing in because everybody gets the homicide part. You have to autopsy those. If you're not bringing in natural deaths or deaths that look natural, what you're missing is perhaps overdoses and drug demographics. If you're not bringing in suicides, what you're going to get is lawsuits because families get more upset about the diagnosis of suicide than any other manner of death. And if that's missed or if that's done in a hasty kind of way, there'll be nothing but contention and lawsuits. Accidents speak for themselves. My recommendation then would be, A, retain the staff that you have. They're doing a terrific job, and their job's only going to get harder. B, keep an eye on the numbers because you can scrimp and you can cut back, but after 25 years in California, having been sued seven times, the first time for wrongful death on an autopsy case, I can tell you those things happen. The lawyers are out there. It's not a good place to scrimp. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else wishing to speak? Anyone else? Good evening. Doug Wargo, 1719 29th Street, City of Kenosha. Um, I'm here because I've been employed as a police officer for the city for 25 years. Um, in that 25 years, the last 15, I've been an evidence technician, so I've had quite the occasion to work um, various scenes, crime scenes, dozens, dozens, dozens of death investigations. Um, being a patrolman, whenever there's a deceased individual found, the, the police respond. Uh, the fire department responds, <coughs> the police respond, and um, we're there to investigate to see what and if anything suspicious happened, um, and then we go from there. My main point is, and I won't need the five minutes, um, these people in the medical examiner's office at this time, I've worked with them for years. They're, they're great people, they're knowledgeable, they know their job, and uh, I, I, I really hope you take some, some careful thought here um, in your decision-making process. So, thank you. Thank you. Anyone else wishing to speak? off topic. <clears throat> My name is Tim Popanda, 350 Burden Avenue, Twin Lakes, Wisconsin. I'm here uh, representing the village of Paddock Lake. It's off topic from the medical examiner's uh, discussion. It's more in line with the uh, um, emergency government and the switch from its current status to the sheriff's department. Um, I experienced working for another municipality the uh, devastation of the tornado out in Wheatland and um, I, I have nothing against the sheriff's department and, and operating it. It's just that it, it's not broken. It worked well for the town of Wheatland and the aftermath of the tornado. Uh, it works well for training us, training uh, emergency government throughout the uh, county. Um, and if it's not broken, I don't understand why it's got to be fixed and changed to the uh, sheriff's department. So I'd like you to consider that in your budget uh, tonight, that uh, leave it as is and, and maybe not put it with the sheriff's department. So thank you. Thank you. Any other citizen comments? Again, this is a different topic. Hello, my name is Carol Vame. I'm um, 5015 Springbrook Road in Pleasant Prairie. But strangely enough, I'm one of the Kenosha Bicycle Ambassadors. Ms. Um, Vame, if you could make sure that microphone is uh, right in front of you, please. Okay. Thank you. Sorry about that. Um, uh, I represent, my husband and I are the Kenosha Co Bicycle Ambassadors and what we do is we reach out to the community and advocate for bicycle use and bring in uh, used bikes. And I'm speaking on behalf of paving some of the, uh, the trails that we have. 
uh, because I think I have a number of, I have sent an email to a number of you, so I'll just highlight some of the topics that I thought uh, were most pertinent. One of them being, obviously you have, there, there are paths and the question is whether to pave them. And my answer to that is that it's just more cost effective. If you have paths, they would be used more and by more people if they were paved. Um, children, you know, on small bikes with small tires are have a hard time in gravel. And, you know, young families getting the kids out there in the stroller, in the, in the uh, wagons. Um, more availability. Right now, there's many times a year where the paths are just not passable unless you do have a mountain bike. Um, so, again, uh, that cuts out a lot of potential use right there. Um, the handicap. If you have a motorized scooter or, or even myself, I had issues with arthritis at one time and walking across my lawn was difficult. So for some of the people who have issues with ankles and knees, um, a paved path could make a difference between getting exercise and not getting exercise. Um, and then bicycle type. Um, right now we're pretty much limited. You have to have kind of knobby tires. I have a bike that I like to ride because it's a good commuter bike, but it has fairly thin wheels. You get on those paths in the spring and you're, you don't know where you're going to end up. Um, so my, my point is that the, if you're going to have paths, having them paved means they'll be used more. It's more cost effective. Um, it's also good for the community in general in terms of reducing costs. People riding their bikes, it, for me and for many people I know, it has made the difference in some time of their life between getting to a job and not getting to a job, between getting to college and not getting to college. And right now I pay a lot more taxes because I like make a lot more money because I did graduate from college and I did get to that part-time job. And at, at this point in time, what it, I, I lived in a time where, when I was younger, you could have a $500, some 1973 Hornet, get in there and fix it yourself. But, but today's cars are not like that. So again, keep that in mind, that it gets, keeps people employed um, and keeps people going to school. Um, and then lastly, as the Kenosha Bicycle Ambassadors, uh, we, we go to various events through the year. Uh, our primary uh, access to the public is we go to Harbor Market um, twice a month, and we talk to many, many people from in Kenosha, from out of Kenosha, a lot of people from out of town, a lot of people riding their bikes to the Harbor Market, and um, they want to know where to ride, um, and they complain, they do complain about the South it's primarily the south path, but the north path also, that they can't get through. And they also talk glowingly about the paths in Illinois. And those people are standing there. They've got their vegetables in hand. And they want to go out to dinner, so. <laughs> Thank you. Any other citizen comments? Mark Montague, 7835 36th Avenue in Kenosha. We're here again tonight to address the uh, situation at the Highway Department and the Department of Public Works. Most of these examples I'll be bringing up are things that we've sat through at different uh, board meetings, the administration meetings, the Finance Committee, the Parks and Highway Committee meetings. So a lot of them examples are things that have happened and are from our notes. One of the biggest ones I think that's the one that hopefully you guys can help us rectify are these in-range pay adjustments. And right now during the, pro the budget process, we heard of two supervisors at the golf courses getting in-range pay adjustments. And I know you supervisors have sat through the meetings and I know you guys know the numbers on the golf courses. And it's a loss. And it's been a loss for a couple of years. And believe me, 
I'll be there the first time riding my bike through the golf course, whatever it takes to get things back on track. But we need to really attack this with our help. Right now, the golf courses are projected next year, 300,000. We had bosses that explained a lot of things that were through mostly excuses. The bosses who took those two positions knew of the pay ranges that they were accepting. That sounds like to me like some sort of contract that you are understanding what you're getting into. For the golf courses, I say break even or break out. Something has to happen. The DPW direct revenue. From the state projections from the DOT for this year, we're looking at numbers not as bad as last. Hopefully that'll equate into the 14 laid off employees that we had sit home for close to five months will be back and have some job security. Right now the DPW is trying to change a, a foreman's position into a superintendent. We heard historically that we always had two superintendents and there were some questions about how the funding was coming from the state on the position that we allegedly had lost, but they still have the money. The truth is, historically, we had two shops, and you probably needed two superintendents at that point for the chain of command. There is no need for two superintendents at the highway department. And I don't think giving people raises when everybody else is taking zeros right now is a great thing to do. During the committee meetings for the Department of Public Works, we heard testimony about, testimony about fuel numbers that were weakly explained by the director of the DPW. Because of a clerical position that was out by ANS or a similar situation, maybe workman's comp, we weren't sure, it had affected the number and it had affected the accounts receivable. If this position is that important to the bottom line that we look at at our budget, budget books, you think you'd want to supply that type of help. In our budget for the highway department, there's one clerical job cut. That could mean a, make, a big difference in revenue if people aren't getting the books done. Again, at a highway department committee meeting, we heard from CABA representative, and his name eludes me, but what he said doesn't. There was talk of the new warehouse that they put in off of Highway N and the East Frontage Road. And I have all kinds of respect for anybody that's into the Kenosha Area Business Alliance, and I understand what you guys here are trying to do and what those people are trying to do. But he did allude to the money from a $1 million donation appropriation. I'm not really sure. And I think that's money well spent. Do not get me wrong on this point. The point is, the county and the city bent over backwards for this company to come in here, change jurisdictional transfers on a lot of roadway, come in, put in a new bridge, a new roadway, and then they come out and where are the good jobs? The man himself said they hire temporary employees. Is that what this co community is going to be built on? I certainly hope not. Again, during the hearings, we heard numbers, and we all love numbers. We heard numbers is $600,000 in local road improvements. Boy, I hope some of that money is going to come back to us, and we're not going to give it to Payne and Dolan as usual. We heard a lot of stuff from the cart paths and the bike trails. If that's where the interest is at, let's do it, but we want to be part of it. We heard of discussion of rebuilding Pets' roadway. We can do this work. We just need to be allowed. And we're hoping that we're involved in these plans. Lastly, I'll give you an example of somebody that has a pay adjustment that I would. Can I just have 45 seconds? Mark? 30. 30, thank you. I just want to bring up this point of an employee that we have. If you're going to give her a, a pay adjustment, give it to Vicki Galich, second generation highway. In case you haven't been watching, she's the one that's been propping up all our numbers in the supervisors. When they have a question, they go to her. <clears throat> she starts earlier than most people get up. Her car's usually the first one in the parking lot. She's a tireless worker for the county good. She brought a prevailing wage contract to the, from the state 
for $275,000 worth of revenue that the state decided to drop. If you're gonna give a pay adjustment to anybody, remember the name, Vicki Galich. If not, it should be zero pay increases until we all get all of our oars in the water and we're all pulling the same way. Thank you very much and I appreciate your time. Thank you. Any other citizen comments? Yes, sir. Good evening, my name is Ron DeGolier. I am at uh, 3524 7th Avenue and I'm here to talk about the Northside bike trail and the budget uh, figure and, and uh, allowing the paving of that and taking advantage of some public funds at the same time. Um, I want to talk mostly first at least on the safety aspect of it. Some of you may know that I spent a lot of years as the race director uh, and bringing the race of food folks and spokes to downtown. And I spent no, no more time on anything than safety, the preparation of the course, and making sure that that wasn't the cause of any crash. The riders themselves were quite good at causing crashes, and they didn't need problems with the road and the course to, uh, to do that as well. We have a considerable parallel, I believe, on the north side of Wisconsin, north side of Kenosha, joining Kenosha and Racine, two unusually close cities. Uh, that should be connected very easily by bicycles. Sheridan Road and 22nd Avenue on the two most easterly are totally unfit for safe cycling. Um, we, the minimum that you have for cycling would be a good example would be I-65, uh, State Highway 165 between Green Bay Road and uh, I-94. The, um, I believe it's at least a four foot paved shoulder, bare minimum to separate the cyclists from the traffic. And that's true whether you're in the four lane section or the two lane section. I and many others feel quite safe cycling there. The choices that were made in redoing the, uh, I'm not sure I'm pointing in the right direction, but anyway, redoing um, North Sheridan Road, um, Bike trails weren't, weren't to be, apparently, because of uh, issues with the township, and uh, that's fine. And the state had a choice <coughs> to either go with a wide paved shoulder or put curbing in. Unfortunately for the safety of many cyclists for years to come, they chose the curbing. 22nd Avenue uh, from the north side going up to Kenosha isn't a whole lot better when there is a shoulder, it's very narrow, and it comes and it goes. Um, what we have left are, is a bike trail that sometimes, in many places, looks like this. Several pictures here. This one is, probably looks the worst. I think that to have at least one safe alternative for cyclists and others, hikers, uh, people out with their family and little kids on their bikes and strollers and so forth to have one that is between the two roads that I mentioned for the sake of safety. And um, I would say this is totally unfit for road bikes. I happen to be a road biker, thin tires, and you can go further and faster and so forth. Uh, but even, even mountain bikes might have a challenge here. The fact is, this is just as unsatisfactory for safe cycling and easy cycling as the roads that we have out there. So I think it's a great opportunity that we have. And I would like to say from a recreational standpoint, I don't know how many are here. I thought there might be some, but I didn't pick up on any, that we are from a uh, tourist um, vacationer aspect from the whole southern side of the state. Kenosha County has the advantage like none other because we attract a lot more people here and a lot of revenue. And for us not to be connected with surrounding areas, and I know there's talk about going out west, uh, it, it would be a shame. And let me tell you a quick, uh, a quick aspect of um, a paved bike trail, uh, like the ones we have along the lake, going out to Parkside and so forth. Um, they're black and in the early spring, the late fall and throughout the winter when we get some snowfall, the very first kind of surface 
to become writable safely and even walking is that which has a black surface, a black top surface under it and uh, making it much more safe uh, for even for joggers as well. So I ask, uh, and I could go on and on with recreation, but I, I won't take any more time now. Safety is the main thing. Please, let's make Kenosha safe uh, for cyclists. Um, and um, let me just tell you one thing. The many people that I unfortunately do I'm see. Let me wrap up very quickly, Mr. DeGaulle. Okay, cycling is uh, people who are probably not as well prepared as, as the experienced cyclist, not wearing bright clothing, not wearing a helmet, not wearing a flasher. They're wearing dark clothing, and uh, they're very vulnerable. Please don't let that happen. You can, you can make a difference. Thank you. Thank you. Any other citizen comments? I, I know there's a couple of you who are anxious to speak, so if you'd be prepared to move quickly. I know uh, Mr. Montague set the tone for extending over the five minutes, but we're going to have to keep you tight if we can. Good evening. I'm Louis Sergani, 4526 29th Avenue, City of Kenosha. I want to talk about all this anti-transit stuff we've been hearing here for the past year or so. Now, this is nothing new. You know, back in the 1930s, the National City Lines Conspiracy, looked it up on Google when you get a chance did the same exact thing and they destroyed transit pretty much all over the United States. Sixty some systems and the Kenosha City motor coach lines was part of it. And the, the chiefs of, those, uh, of that operation, General Motors, Standard Oil of California, Firestone Tire Rubber, Mack Truck, Real Truck, Phillips 66, were all arrested, tried and convicted. Well, now we have a different way of doing it. So this, uh, this whole referendum out in the county, I understand six municipalities out there uh, put together a, or approved a referendum vote that said something, I wish I had it with me, but correct me if I'm wrong, um, we're against any new tax to support transit anywhere in the county of Kenosha, which I presume would include Kenosha, the city. Does that mean that the city can vote on what happens in these six municipalities? I mean, did anybody think about that? And furthermore, it was a loaded question. I guess we all pretty much appreciate that. We could all put down things like, would you approve a new tax for schools? Would you approve a new tax for police, for fire, for rescue? Would you approve a new tax for uh, snow shoveling? The answer is pretty much always going to be no. It's a loaded question, let's be honest. But I want to thank you once again, as I did last month, when that thing came up here in front of your board for not only giving it not even a second but not even a second thought so again thank you for that I don't have time to tell you about this national city lines thing but then let's say that these people who wanted this referendum wanted a voice in transit I'll buy that chance to vote wasn't that one of the things that came up chance to vote I'll buy that but maybe not either, because where was the chance to vote on the interstate expansion? You know, it's $2 billion. Not only didn't we get a chance to vote, we barely have any, had any public hearings on that. And that's not the end of it. Milwaukee wants again, even though the city of Racine had almost a, a riot in spring of 1994 on the north side of 32, about extending Interstate 794 into Racine and maybe Kenosha County. This has been going on since 1965. Man, Mr. Huddle was a director of the uh, Southeastern Wisconsin Regional Planning Commission. He wanted to run that. Protest after protest, even though there was no vote able to be taken, and it's, it was stopped. It was stopped in April 1994. This is a, a billion and a half dollar project that they want to run in the Racine. And I'll bet there isn't one person in this room that knows about that. How about a chance to vote on that? Can we have a chance to vote on um, paying City of Kenosha money, pays for the transit systems out in western Kenosha County. Nobody ever voted on that. By the way, I'm for it. I'm for transit. Just found out today, the story came out, you might have heard about it. They found that their estimates of the remaining Alaska reserves are 90% less than they had thought. And by 2011, 2012, they're predicting a big increase in gasoline prices. So there's more than meets the eye in this. And I know you guys and ladies are pretty hip. 
most of you. And you know what's going on. But I urge you to get on Google and look what happened to national city lines, including what they did to the city of Kenosha, 1942 to 1947. And keep your eye out for this secret highway that they want to build into Kenosha that nobody's asking for a vote on. I want to thank you. Mr. Gunny, thank you. Anyone else wishing to speak? Hi, uh, James Kranz, uh, 3032 47th Avenue, uh, Kenosha. Um, I just want to say a few things about in uh, support of paving the uh, North Shore bike path. Um, first of all, I want to mention, and I think some people have already said this very well, that the path is very heavily used by many people other than bicyclists. Uh, joggers, uh, when I'm out there on a good day in summer, there are a lot of strollers. A lot of people use that path. Um, the, the bike path as it is right now is really in very bad shape. I don't know if you, it, many of you have had the chance to see some of the photos that were taken. Uh, I took a number of them after the last heavy rain. Uh, it's in very bad shape. It's, it, instead of the original convex surface, it's now concave with many deep holes and ruts that fill with rainwater and make it just very, very hard to use. Um, I guess I would encourage any people, or any of you that have any questions about it anymore, to, to just actually take a look at it. Um, park on KR, there's a nice little place to park and take a stroll down to the south from KR. Well, maybe first take a stroll up into Racine on the nice asphalt and then take a, st a short stroll down into the Kenosha side and just see the difference. Um, I think it's really pretty dramatic and it would be easy to see uh, with just a few minutes of time. So uh, again, I hope that you'll all uh, support that. I think it's a really good community asset. And with the state money available, I really hope we'll take advantage of it. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else wishing to speak? Ray Fort Johnny, 8731 45th Avenue. <coughs> Excuse me. I'm here to support what I think. I'm, I'm here to beat a dead horse, I think, because I think I've heard an, enough support from this audience that I think I know what you're going to do, and that you're going to support the paving of the bicycle paths north and south of the city. Uh, my compliments to the county and the fact that they reserved that North Shore right away back when they did, it was visionary. And the fact that it was available for a bike path all these years is just extraordinary. And the fact that it links other bike paths and other communities is, it, well, it's superior. This is good for a number of reasons, and I think sometimes it's overlooked. As, as we, we turn into this, uh, uh, this, this new century, and we see the unemployment problems we have now, this community has to face new employment opportunities, embrace them, find them. Tourism's one of them. Uh, hopefully we find some other ones, but tourism's one of them, and the bike paths, believe it or not, play a significant role in it. I know when Harbor Park was done, we I was able to split the bike paths with the pedestrian way because I saw it some other places and I thought it was pretty cool. But I was amazed one day when I saw, after it had first been opened, when a car pulled up with bicycles on the back, and I literally stopped the people and asked them what they were doing. They said, we drove here simply to ride this path. Now, if people will drive from out of town to ride that path, they certainly will ride to the community on, this, on the, the, uh, the North Shore right away, both in north and south of the city. One other side note, the other reason it's good to pave it, <clears throat> when I got my first bike as an adult, I drove down the North Shore south of the city. And I had, for those who were bicycles enthusiasts, I had sew-up tires. Now, those don't have balloons in them. And I managed to get a flat tire. Flat tire very easily. So I went and had a change. So I had to pay someone. And the next day I went out and I got another flat tire. And it was explained to me that on gravel, sew-ups don't work. So I had to buy new rims. So you're going to save, not me, but maybe you'll save someone that problem of having to buy new rims and different tires. Support it. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else wishing to speak? Stan Rosensteel, 7843 32nd Avenue. Uh, I also am in favor of paving the bike trail, and uh, I guess you've heard a lot about this already, and I don't feel much like speechifying today, so thank you. Thank you. Anyone else wishing to speak? Hi, I'm 
Larry Obachowski from 3813 14th Avenue, Kenosha. I just wanted to say I think it's great that the county got to vote on that KRM train line on that question. And I only wish that the county board here would have let the whole county vote on that. And I know that Mr. Kubicki at the end of the last meeting, the last committee meeting, he was going to set up another meeting at the time and I don't think he was very truthful about that. He had, a, he had his own agenda that he was going by on this and I don't think that's right. I think these people, all of you, should be held to a higher standard than that. He should have had that meeting, that other meeting, and that, quite, that should have been debated and I don't think that was right. And I actually think I'm looking for his resignation and I know you stood up for him at that last time I talked here and you told me he would follow through on that. And I'd expect you to do something about it, too. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Obachowski. Good to see you. Anyone else wishing to speak? Anyone else wishing to speak? Good evening. Steve Casey, 7306. 22nd Avenue and just so you know I'm not in violation of my wife's contract that I had where I said I would never attend any more meetings <laughs> at City Hall <laughs> I'm at the County Board meeting tonight so um, and I'd also like to say that I've been uh, very adequately represented by Mr. Johnson from the 12th District for many many years I'm here to speak on the uh, on the medical examiner's office. I've been a long supporter of all of their activities, and as I look around the room, I can see many families that I have served, both on the county board and both in the uh, in the public. I believe uh, I believe that you have a model here, uh, as far as a forensic pathologist that may not work for Kenosha County. I believe uh, that Jim Cruiser and this county board has been very proactive in fixing some of the problems that I have felt that uh, have been uh, not well served in the past. I was the one, I was the uh, funeral director uh, that, that took Jim Cruiser through Brookside uh, many years ago, a couple years ago, to uh, to show him exactly how this county was serving the public in f as far as uh, families who are experiencing deaths in very unfortunate situations. And much to the credit of his office and this county board, he fixed the problem. Took the county, took the uh, medical examiner's office out of the Brookside building and, uh, and I believe served the public very well. The fact of the matter is um, this business model may not be working for Kenosha County. We have lost two medical examiners, two forensic pathologists in a very short period of time. And that tells me one thing, that this may be a business model that may not be working. I've worked with, uh, as a uh, funeral home owner for 10 years and a licensed funeral director for 25 years. I've worked uh, with many, many counties over the past. And uh, just to name a few, I think of John Griebel in Walworth County, who has served Walworth County as a layperson for close to 50 years. I think of Tom Terry, who serves Racine County, and he's a layperson, and he served, uh, and I may be speaking out of school, but I believe he's served the community for between 20 and 30 years. I think of Dodge County, P.J. Strobel. I think of Kelly McAndrews in Washington County, and I think of John Haliski in Ozaki County, all of which are not forensic pathologists, and all are coroners or laypersons. There's something wrong with the way we're handling things in Kenosha County. And I, this is not about personalities. I have played racquetball, and Dr. Wittick is a friend of mine. And he always has been. This is not about personalities in the office. 
I get along with everybody in the Kenosha Medical Examiner's Office. This is about the business model and what works and doesn't work. And what makes me uniquely qualified to comment on this in front of all of you is that we are a funeral home that conducts funerals in both Racine County and Kenosha County. Granted, I do about 80% of my funerals in Kenosha County, but my physical location of my funeral home office, because family options, Casey Family Options operates a lot differently than most traditional funeral homes. We don't have a funeral home that we use for funerals. We are physically located in Racine County, which means I do about 20% of my funerals in Kenosha, in, in about 80% in Kenosha County and about 20% in Racine. I'll do about 175 death certificates this year and about 80% of that in Kenosha County. I work intimately with the Racine County model and many other counties. I believe that Jim Cruiser and this county board, is it down to 30 seconds already? Uh, that's zero. If you could wrap up, please, briefly. <laughs> you know, I've never been cut off in the city council, just so you know, Your Honor. I'm, I'm sure you haven't. <laughs> I'll cut this short because my wife wants me to come home anyways. I encourage you to support Jim Cruiser and the model that is proposed. And this is not about personalities. This is about a different change in Jim Cruiser and this county board being proactive in fixing a problem. Thank you. Thank you. Any other citizen comments? Anyone else wishing to address the county board? If not, citizen comments are closed, and I will uh, thank all of you for your comments. Uh, I appreciate them. I appreciate your candor, and um, I think it was obvious we were paying attention to your comments, so thank you. <clears throat> you read this next one? Presentation, buddy. Why are we not? Presentation of the 2011 budget by Supervisor Clark. At uh, this point, I have asked Supervisor Clark to uh, take some time this evening to, to give us a presentation, an overview of the discussions that took place in the Finance Committee, the process by which the uh, committees reviewed the budget, some of the uh, uh, <coughs> compromises, I guess, that were made throughout the course of the budget deliberations, and uh, I'd ask you to be patient. I'd ask you to uh, indulge it. I think it will be informative and will set up for what, will, what obviously will be our debate tomorrow night, uh, but I believe it will be something that will give us a uh, framework for which we can debate the budget tomorrow evening. Supervisor Clark. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. First, I want to make an announcement. The uh, Thursday night finance committee meeting uh, is being rescheduled, so there will not be a Thursday night finance committee meeting. There was one item that was on the agenda that was primarily the approval of the 1392 contract, which has been approved by the administration committee already. We're going to act on that before the December 2nd county board meeting and uh, presumably act on that uh, contract that night. I want to thank, uh, first of all, uh, the chairman of the county board for his leadership uh, in this process. Um, Certainly after being presented with a budget that uh, um, was outside of our budget parameter, he called a meeting together to get the pulse of where this county board stood and where they wanted to go. And without that leadership and that direction, uh, you s certainly sometimes don't know where you're gonna go or where you're gonna end up. Uh, as far as the, uh, the county board committees, I think in all my time on the county board, I think what, observing the various different committees, talking to the various different supervisors, certainly um, believe that there was a very healthy debates. Um, and um, I, I think they, they, 
truly trying to find ways to get to our number. I'm just being distracted here. It's <clears throat> um, I'd also like to thank the, uh, the county executive um, and the administration. They've spent, they, they began their budget process in April and May, um, and they have some very difficult decisions that they make in this budget, and there are very difficult decisions that we have to make or we have to affirm in this budget. Obviously, a budget is about priorities. We don't have a bottomless pit that we can just go to the taxpayers and hit them all the time. Uh, this county board has a, uh, clearly a proven track record in that regard. On your desk tonight, you will notice that there are yellow sheets. They are updates of all the budget pages in the budget that have been changed. If you leave that on your desk tonight along with your uh, your budget booklet, uh, the finance staff will update your book for you. So when you come in tomorrow, everything will be in order. It was uh, 2002, I sat through my first budget, adopting a 2003 budget, being a uh, first time supervisor. Ran on a platform that really I looked at um, the norm for our levy was seven and a half, eight percent between seven and eight every year. And I ran because I felt that, you know, that was too high. I thought we needed to have a culture shift in the county. I sat through my first budget, the 2003 budget, and I remember sitting, sitting here listening to all the supervisors congratulate the executive at the time about a wonderful job that we did. And essentially. It was another 7% levy, and we levied everything we could except for $25,000. Today, our levy is, and I looked for the number, I couldn't find it, but I, I can tell you right now, and I'll report on it tomorrow night, we're well over a million dollars underneath that number. In, uh, in response to that, that feeling of helplessness, and could you make a difference, uh, the county board, uh, we introduced a resolution that changed the way our budget process was handled. For the first time in the history of the county board in 2003, we introduced a levy cap resolution that said to the county executive, this is advisory, this is where we would like to see Kenosha County's budget come in. Since that time, and I did a synopsis, I don't know if that was put on your desk, if, if it wasn't, it'll be there tomorrow. Um, I took a look at our budget history from 2003 forward. In 2003, the average home was $145,909 and had a tax of almost $712. Today, 2011, we have an average home value of $174,904 with an average tax of roughly $744. Over that eight year period, we've had an increase on your tax bill of $32. In total, $32 over eight years on the average home. That's $3.99 a year over that eight year period. That's a total of almost four and a half percent. Certainly, that puts us with uh, well below the inflation, inflationary numbers, the consumer price index. The consumer price index from December 02 to September, to September of 2010 changed by almost 21% compared to our actual change of four and a half. If, we, if the county followed the CPI model of increasing taxes every year by CPI, our tax bill today on the average home would be $860, or roughly $125 more than where we are today, just the county's portion. This levy before us that we're, that, uh, that we're proposing tonight, after a committee process with several supervisors attending the finance committee and doing their work in the committee, with the leadership of the chairman of the board who has attended many of the committees and all of the finance 
uh, committees in working with the county executive who after the, 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 the leadership of this county board said, we, we charted a course in June, that's where we want to be, was agreeable and very helpful in working with, with this county board in bringing us back to where we should have been in the first place. This budget before you is a, I gotta find the exact number, but I believe it is a 2.89% levy increase. The, t the increase on an average home is $8.26. That's a 1.12% change uh, in the tax from one year to the other. At the same time, the consumer price index is an anticipated to be 1.14%. Like you, like our constituents, we are all taxpayers. We are all sensitive to what the taxes are. Our record has proven, proven that over the years. You know, I've heard from many people that say we should have a freeze, we should have a cut. And on your desk, I believe you have a pie chart that talks about where the 2011 <coughs> budget levy is by department. This number, the levy numbers represented here are net of those revenues that aren't attributable to a department. For instance, sales tax revenue, shared revenue, um, those sort of investment revenue. So when I'm talking with uh, people, certainly I, I point out our record, but I also point out where we spend our dollars. And I ask them, I'm, I'm, I'm all ears, I'm willing to listen. Where should, if you think our levy should be lower or we should be more responsible, Please tell me, please tell me where it should be. 54% of our levy dollars go to law enforcement. That's our sheriff department, that's our courts, that's our jails, uh, the district attorney's office. Where do we cut? What area, would you, what area would you like to cut? Would you like to see your response time go down? Would you like to see less incar incarceration? Would you like to see a, a slower court process? The next largest area in our budget is, uh, miscellaneous, is miscellaneous area and debt service. 15% of our budget goes to debt service. Certainly the county executive, uh, and we've heard this with uh, the bonding, you know, we want to be a AAA county. We're not gonna be a AAA county by borrowing everything in, in going to the levy. Uh, I've asked uh, for February, in the finance committee, we're gonna have a presentation by Ellers to ask the questions, where, how do they think we get there? This is not something that we'll probably see happening within the next 10 years, but if we don't have that objective or that target, we're never gonna get there. The other uh, two major, other two significant areas, 8% in public works, that's our highways, that's our parks. Are we not gonna plow the roads as much? Are we not gonna maintain our roads and our infrastructure? Human services, 8% of our budget. We're at a time when, when our constituency has the biggest need for uh, job benefits, uh, healthcare benefits, uh, all the things that human services offer. Our finance and administration represents 6%. Planning and development represents 4%. Executive and legislative areas represent 4% of our budget. I was out uh, taking a look at the Wisconsin Taxpayer Alliance and I found an interesting uh, bit of information from 2000 to 2008. The per capita average change in revenue for Kenosha County was 1.4%. Out of 72 counties, we were 68th. In that revenue number, you consider uh, sales tax, government aids, property taxes. In the expense categories, when we look at Kenosha County, we look at our operating capital number, we represent 50 out of 72. Our general government, we're 49 out of 72. Our highways, 67 out of 72. Our health and human services, 51 
out of 72, and our public safety, 14 out of 72. I'm going to go through the um, just a review of the highlights of the budget. Um, again, this budget is coming in at 2.89 percent, less than nine dollars on the average home. This budget uh, makes the difficult decision to reorganize the emergency services from a lay office into the sheriff's department. It's reorganizing the medical examiner's office. From a from a having a MD uh, medical examiner, a change in the business model. The discussion tonight, the discussion tomorrow night, is not about who; it's about the change in the model. I'm not going to get into. I'll get into that tomorrow night. My opinions. I'm representing finance and what this budget is. <clears throat> We're addressing economic development uh, in this budget. There's a million dollars reprogramming of of uh, dollars that are previously earmarked in the budget for Chrysler. I want you to know that this money is just being earmarked. It is going to be subject to the Finance Committee and County Board approval to set the parameters how that money is going to be used. This is the environment that we're in. We see it all the time. And, and we are trying to be competitive in being able to attract the jobs to sustain our community. The major capital projects in this budget, we have, uh, you know, I believe we're paving 13 miles of our road. We are doing the bike path by, and leveraging um, uh, state and federal dollars to do that. Um, after much discussion, presentation at this county board, another presentation in the uh, finance committee we're going to be, we've, we're recommending the uh, proceeding with the fiber project. The number one area, uh, what seems to be the number one concern in this issue at this point in time is public safety. The redundancy, uh, if, if there were to be a major event out west, whether you had country thunder and something happened and all the phone lines were jammed, by having this redundant switch, we're going to be able to have our communication. Uh, Todd Battle from CABA gave a presentation on the uh, potential benefits of uh, the economic development. One of the questions that we ask in the Finance Committee uh, is, what is the intended payback? Is there a payback? And there is a revenue stream that is intended, um, you know, potentially $200,000 a year. There is operating cost of maintaining these lines, but the one question that I wanted to hear in the committee, and I don't have the exact numbers on my mind right now, was that there is a potential for payback on this over a period of time. Um, we're continuing our uh, investment in the uh, IT infrastructure. Uh, we're upgrading our phone systems. Um, We've had a lengthy uh, debate and discussion this last year. We ha we've had a um, uh, IT steering committee that has made recommendations and fleshed some of this out. My, 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 my beef with the steering committee is uh, most of that is administrative in function and not legislative in function. And we, uh, the county executive has committed to adding more professionals on that committee so we can get a, have a better sounding board. We're uh, maintaining our infrastructure, the Molinero building. We had a presentation at, at this uh, county board. The Molinero building at Courthouse, that's a five and a half million dollar project over two years. <coughs> um, we heard in that presentation to do nothing, we would have a significant increase in our costs in five years. It's the prudent thing to do, that's what we're doing. I'm going to uh, just briefly run through the uh, changes in the uh, county executive's um, budget, uh, and I believe um, that summary of adjustments may be on page 10, but I'm just going to run through it. The county executive came in with a budget, uh, a levy recommendation of 58 million, just over 58 million dollars. The county board, through its uh, committee and finance committee process, came in with uh, 
$1,136,000 of cuts. Uh, in working with the administration, um, they've come in with a $25,000 cut on the, uh, in, in an uh, uh, operating cost that they were able to flesh out in IT. There was a uh, $35,000 uh, capital reduction in the, or there a $35,000 uh, reduction in the medical examiner's cost. Just some of the, uh, the, the debate there is we're budgeting for 95 autopsies. Um, when you look at Brown, Otagami, Washington, Racine, that, that model, that 95 number seems to be a reasonable, attainable number. I didn't buy the argument tonight by Mr. Peterson from Milwaukee. When you look at the numbers and you benchmark it, he has got to be saying that those communities aren't doing their job. When you look at the population and you look at the per capita of their examinations, it's very clear. There was a reduction in the Department of Public Works on gas of $4,000. Uh, the the, uh, the uh, Judiciary and Law Committee recommended taking the um, federal inmate revenue from, and I'm going to use a rough number, of $6 million to 6750000 It is anticipated that Kenosha County is going to end up at $7.5 million in that revenue. Um, what we discussed in the Finance Committee, the profitability on those dollars is roughly, I don't have the exact percentage, but it's close to 50-50. I think we had about 46% cost for those direct variable cost to those revenues. So essentially what that means is, and the pro I don't know what the probability is, but if there were a change in policy by the, by the administration or we lost that contract, we would have a three and a, a three and a half million dollar budget hole to fill. So um, anything above 3.75, uh, three and a half million, 3.75 million is going to benefit our levy. So if we're at 3.75 and we're taking it to 6.5, that's about a $3 million hole that we're looking to address. Certainly with this uh, uh, budgeted item, we're anticipating that we're going to have a surplus in the Sheriff Department if all things are equal. Personally, I don't believe that we should be stretching the revenue. I agree with the executive that uh, we want to wean ourselves from the reliance on that. We certainly can use any of those excess revenues to build our reserves, to reduce capital uh, borrowing for capital projects. Um, budgeting a revenue is a, again, is something that is, you know, a guess. Budgeting expense obviously is more controllable. The, uh, uh, the sheriff, when we were in the finance committee meetings, came in with uh, roughly a $43,000 savings that he thought the sheriff's department could uh, accomplish by taking over the emergency services. They took a look at the various different uh, personnel uh, in the positions, and they, they came in with roughly a $43,000 savings. He provided a $45,000 uh, reduction in the sh uh, grocery cost in the uh, sheriff's in the jail. Our debt service was reduced by about $30,000. That reduction was a result of our, uh, we, we did a refinancing uh, a couple meetings ago, and uh, Ellers was here and said that that number, uh, we had savings, that's the impact of savings in the first year. Within the uh, Health Insurance Internal Service Fund, <laughs> At the time that the executive presented their budget, they had an RFP out for the provider of the, uh, can't think of the right thing, but uh, TSA, I think they call it, um, for the provider of our health benefits. The actuaries came in with a number uh, that they thought that we could save $440,000 by making a change to a new provider for this next year. Um, the number that we've chose to plug into this budget 
is to recognize that we're going to have the $375,000 in savings. And certainly another, another difficult decision, the county executive in his budget uh, eliminated the uh, vacation payout for the non-reps. Uh, in reviewing that in prior years, and that's something that came up during the uh, chairman's meeting back in May, the elimination of the non-rep payouts. I observed that that number was about half of what I thought it was. I inquired of the administration, uh, and it was it was uh, clear that the this the budgets proposed by the executive did not eliminate the sworn non-rep vacation payout. That. Uh, uh, has now been presented to the administration and judiciary and law committees, and that passed each committee on a vote of three to one. We, um, <clears throat> one of the major areas that was proposed that came out of the administrative, administrative committee was a flex, uh, to the elimination of the flex benefit. Um, <clears throat> Certainly, there's opinions about uh, making um, making changes to one class of employee. Um, in this budget resolution, uh, we've asked that the administrative committee take a look at all employee benefits, all employee benefits, health insurance contributions, contributions to um, Wisconsin retirement, vacation payouts, Everything's on the table and come back with recommendations to this county board, recommendations to the administration before we go into our next round of negotiations. Certainly I expect it to see changes and this may be the last year that flex benefits, the payout, the having flex benefits is on the table, but to come in and do it in a knee-jerk knee reaction, well thought out reaction, something that's been taught up, thought of, but to not give it the full evaluation, the feeling of the finance committee was, let's pull it back and let's evaluate the whole thing. We've also asked the uh, administrative committee to review the, um, the flex, I'm sorry, the non-rep pay plan that's been on the table for many years. There was a proposal by the administration that came into the budget process. The administrative committee didn't think that was appropriate to just give it that little bit of time and there will be some uh, some debate on that we had the golf budget come in um, and there were certainly some questions as to what the revenues were uh, it seemed that the prior budgeting method has been put your expenses together uh, and then plug the number to revenues the uh, finance committee wanted a plan if you're going to increase your revenues, and I believe they came in and increased their revenues by about five to six percent, they provided uh, uh, details of how they were going to do that. Certainly for the first time that uh, I recall something to measure the leadership of the uh, golf department and hold them accountable for their actions or if they come up short to hold them accountable. In this budget, there's been, uh, there are some changes, requested changes in, in adding employees. There's uh, in-range adjustments. Those adjustments went through uh, the administrative committee, all of them, except for the golf. Um, and I, I, can't, I can't recall, but I don't think the golf approved them. The Highway and Parks Committee did approve them. Uh, the, in the finance committee, we brought this budget forward, and we had discussion on on, on every single new position being added. Um, we we affirmed the administration's committee on the in-range adjustments. Those in-range adjustments, for anybody's knowledge, the cost is about seventy-five hundred dollars on those adjustments. Uh, we also affirmed the uh, county executive's um, recommendation to have the in-range adjustments on the uh, director of golf and the uh, golf uh, superintendent. Uh, that, that had a split decision from the administration committee and the highway and parks committee, and uh, that's what we did. That's our uh, Kenosha County budget. Um, 
I think as a responsible budget, we certainly all sit here as taxpayers and we, I think, have proven that we are sensitive to our constituency uh, during their time of need. And we have, a, we have to balance between a tax levy <coughs> and providing those needed services. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman Clark. Uh, Clark by my scorecard, I think you only uh, overstepped the uh, report once and got into a little bit of debate, so I uh, applaud the effort. Nicely done. That will, uh, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn the uh, county board meeting. Moved by Supervisor Singer, second by Supervisor Michael. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed, motion carries. We'll immediately call to order the annual meeting, and uh, I will forego the uh, roll call as all 28 are in attendance. Once again, we have citizen comments. I'm sorry, where am I? What did I say, annual meeting? All right, well then we'll immediately call the organizational meeting to order. Once again, the roll is uh, all 28 are in attendance. Citizen comments. We are on the green sheet for those who are uh, looking. Citizen comments, anyone wishing to speak? Paul Feldudo, 8140 57th Avenue, Pleasant Prairie. I'm a member of the uh, sworn non-reps of the Sheriff's Department. All supervisors received a letter jointly from all the non-reps, sworn non-reps of the Sheriff's Department tonight, uh, referring to a resolution which will be read the first time tonight, second time tomorrow night, and debated. We would ask that you uh, read this letter prior to voting on the resolution, and thank you for your time. Thank you. Any other <coughs> citizen comments? Anyone else wishing to address the board? Seeing, are you good, guys? Seeing no other comments, citizen comments are closed. Announcements of the chairman. Uh, just a couple. Uh, once again, I'd like to extend my condolences to uh, Vice Chairman Eckerness. Uh, he sent the county board a thank you card in recognition of the passing of his wife, and uh, our thoughts do and continue to go out to you and your family. Um, behind us, if you haven't noticed, behind me on the uh, podium is the Kenosha County flag that was signed by uh, the local members who are serving overseas in Iraq, I believe, and uh, it took us a little bit, but the flag has been displayed behind us, so again, we want to uh, recognize the men and women who support uh, our freedoms. And finally, on Saturday, I attended, as did many in the room, or a few in the room here anyways, maybe not many, the uh, Council of Government meeting, and I just want to urge all of you, if you have the opportunity, the next time uh, we're noticed on the Council of Government's meeting that you, uh, if at all possible, attend. It's uh, some good dialogue. It's an opportunity to get together with all the municipalities throughout Kenosha County, exchange thoughts and ideas, and I'd urge you all to attend if you're available. Old business. I'm sorry, supervisor reports. Supervisor Grady. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Building and Grounds had its November meeting earlier this evening, and just three brief things to touch upon, and that is in regards to the Public Safety Building, the addition is completely done. It's done, it's completed, it's occupied. We're happy that it came in uh, on time, under budget. The renovation is currently in process, should be substantially completed by December 1st, and that will have KPD, Kenosha Police Department, Joint Services Records, Joint Services Administration being occupied and up and running by that date. Um, second point I'd like to bring up involves uh, the renovation of the courthouse and the Molinero building. We have had uh, three bidders that are pre-qualified to um, make bids on the renovation of that. They're all good in the area of limestone and other technical details will have to be done on that project. Um, the bid packages are out and they will be due December 10th, so we'll be receiving bids from those three qualified contractors if they choose to bid um, December 10th. It's been the mood of our committee that we have wanted to have some type of guarantee, some type of warranty in the future on these large capital projects that both the contractor and the uh, architect would live up to a certain expectation, perhaps a two-year, three-year, five-year guarantee. 
It was not included in the bid package that went out, but as a bid alternate, those entities will be requested to submit in writing their proposal for a warranty or a guarantee on the work that they perform. So in this manner, when we enter these large expenditures, five, six million dollar project, we'd like to have some recourse that the work that's being done in these buildings will be done properly, can be inspected, and we can have some guarantee, if you will, that it's done properly. So that will be done, and uh, we'll have more information for you on that point at one of our future meetings. Last point I'd like to bring up is that the uh, lease agreement on the public safety building, you know, of course, is an agreement between the city, the county, and the entities that operate inside that building. In past lease agreements, capital outlays and expenditures that have required repair and so forth were solely the county's burden. And in our new, le new lease arrangement, we have a more equitable division among repairs, capital expenditures. It goes way beyond our ability to go into it this evening. But we'd like to have the administration bring someone who has better knowledge, a little bit more detail. One of our future meetings, hopefully December or January, we can have a representative come explain the details of the lease agreement between all these entities so we're up to speed on that. Those are my comments, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Supervisor Grady. Supervisor Elverman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, a couple of things from uh, Highway and Parks and Golf. Uh, the uh, October weather has uh, helped immensely in the uh, golf operation and, and now the November weather is uh, giving us uh, some lifts. I was out in uh, Nebraska over the weekend chasing birds and uh, it was 74 degrees out there and I, I said, boy, I'm gonna drive into the cold weather last night and it was 64 when I got home. So I know the golf courses were busy uh, all across the, the, uh, the drive home. Highways, uh, anyone that travels to the west has known that Highway 50 has been under construction all summer. Uh, I noticed I'm moving a lot of barrels tonight on my way here. I believe we're ending the last week of that construction. Uh, on parks, uh, we had two open houses that I announced here at the, uh, the county board for the uh, KD and, and uh, F park that's, uh, that we've had under construction. Over the last two years, we've had um, uh, youth, uh, I don't know what you call them, uh, the uh, uh, a work group of youth working out at the county parks, working on uh, our cart pass and various projects, or our uh, walking pass, cart pass. And uh, the last um, uh, month, we did two open houses at the KD Park to kind of showcase those trails. And uh, we also allowed fishing in the lake there, the 39-acre lake. The first weekend, we had what we thought was a, a very good response. Uh, the second weekend, I asked uh, uh, Mr. Rudy's staff to maybe make a few more maps because uh, you know people might hear about this. Well, on the 30th, we were overwhelmed. Uh, Nick Murphy and I left at 5 o'clock in the evening. We were there at 6.30 in the morning, uh, handing out maps, taking people out on the trails. Um, it was a phenomenal um, uh, setup as far as getting people involved, seeing what we had there. And the overall response that we received was that we don't have to do any more for people to enjoy what we've already got. Uh, we have a Green Ribbon Committee that is working on plans to uh, establish a uh, uh, state-of-the-art uh, new vision park for Kenosha County there. What we have now developed, as far as the walking trails, the lake, is something that we can let people begin to enjoy um, from what we've seen as soon as possible, from the response that we've received as soon as possible. So I'm going to be uh, working and uh, talking to the county executive already with the, uh, the uh, Parks Department people, and they're all on board. What we're looking at is not uh, having to spend any money to do this. We've, everything is there. Uh, we will uh, be bringing uh, reports to the county board 
and uh, what we're hoping for and working on in the uh, Highway and Parks Committee is something as early as next spring. Uh, and I would urge anyone that would want, uh, whether good or bad weather, to take a tour uh, and see what we've actually been showing people there to, uh, to call me. Don't email me. I don't answer those. Um, uh, give me a call. My, my phone's uh, always available and uh, could, would gladly take you out there and, uh, and see what people have uh, been raving about. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Supervisor Elberman. Two comments. One, I appreciate all of your uh, effort with regard to the, the park. Uh, I agree that it is in a condition where we should uh, look for opportunities for the public to enjoy it. Secondly, I did notice the barrels on Highway 50, and I've noticed them what seems to be year after year after year. They keep tearing up new concrete after new concrete after new concrete. I, I trust they're finally uh, wrapping that up. Well, Mr. Chairman, you know, uh, Mr. Sipsma, uh, gets questioned by me quite a bit on that, especially on this project. What they did was uh, uh, back when, when uh, Highway 50 was, was initially run out, it was run out to, uh, I think, just past Highway 83, and it was 12 years ago, I think, from there to Lake Geneva. There were some soft sections in Paddock Lake that they went down 30 feet, uh, added stone, couldn't concrete, and they paved them. Uh, there was some other areas same situation so this is what was addressed this time um, but it took forever and <clears throat> I would uh, I would probably be stretching off my report and getting into debate if I went into uh, my thoughts on, on, on what that is but uh, I'll, I'll, I'll just give a little bit uh, people are bidding these projects too low uh, because people are looking for work and when work uh, comes up that they're making a profit on, they move to other projects. Highway 50 sat for two weeks, the last two weeks, without more than three people on it from Paddock Lake to Highway P for no reason in this nice weather. Mr. Sipsma questioned the state because it's a state-run project. And uh, this week, all of a sudden, things started to happen again. So same company is doing all the construction in Burlington. So that's Well, we both know full well how they're bidding projects out there in this current climate. So I appreciate the report. <coughs> Any other supervisor reports? Seeing no lights, clerk. Old business ordinance, second reading, two required from Judiciary and Law, Finance and Legislative <laughs> Committees, an ordinance to repeal and recreate section 4.401A of the Municipal Code of Kenosha County entitled Jail Maintenance Cost. Judiciary and Law, Michaels, yes. Haas, yes. Johnson, yes. Ron Frederick, yes. Singer, yes. Finance, Clark, yes. O'Day, yes. Gens, Jeff Gens, yes. Singer, yes. Ekronis, yes. Legislative, Kabicki, yes. Haas, yes. Hallman, yes. Ron Frederick, excused. Boyd Frederick, yes. Supervisor Michael. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Chairman. I move ordinance number seven. Ordinance seven moved by Supervisor Michael, seconded by Supervisor Clark. Supervisor Michael. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Basically, this is an ordinance um, allowing the county to charge um, a decent rate um, to the municipalities for um, the use of our jail facility. Um, currently, uh, municipal, excuse me, municipalities are char charged approximately $13 a day. We charge the, uh, our federal inmates over $70 a day. So I mean, um, it's important that uh, we do this. Um, we change the, the rate. Um, basically from 13 to in the this next year will be $21 and uh, year 2012 will be 28 um, it will be in year 2013 to 36 um, and 2014 will be $44 um, also attached it shows that to be honest with you most municipalities do not use our our jail if you look at uh, Bristol you look at Salem you look at Wheatland um, they're all at zero you have Paddock Lake approximately $93, Silver Lake, $89. Um, the major user of our jail, if you look at the stats, is the city of Kenosha, which is about $12,000 a year. So uh, I think it's important that we do this. I urge your approval. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor. Supervisor Rose. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm going to support the ordinance, but I think it's well to note that uh, we are losing money even with these rates. Uh, I'm, I'm not. We never really been told clearly what the uh, cost per inmate is, but I 
think probably in that 44 to $50 range is, is more likely our, our actual cost. So I, I think the beneficial part of that, this uh, ordinance presented to us is that we're not losing as much money as we were before, but we're, we're still losing money. And uh, as a city uh, person, uh, the rest of the county uh, seems to be helping to subsidize the city. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor. Any other Supervisor comments? <coughs> if not, all those in favor of uh, Ordinance 7 signify by saying aye. aye. Those opposed? Ordinance carries. Policy resolution second reading two required. From the Finance Committee, a resolution regarding use of procurement credit cards. Finance Clark, yes. O'Day, yes. Jeff Gens, yes. Ekronis, yes. Singer, yes. Supervisor Clark. I move policy resolution number one. Policy resolution one moved by Supervisor Clark, seconded by Supervisor O'Day. Supervisor Clark. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, this resolution is really taking, uh, uh, getting Kenosha County <coughs> into the current uh, current times as it comes down to purchasing. Uh, this, these are not, number one, to be construed with regular credit cards. These are cards that are very, very well controlled. Uh, who can use them? What amount is on them? What, can be, what they can be used for? Um, there are instances where county employees are uh, expected to go to a conference or expected to go somewhere and we're asking county employees to front the money so we can reimburse them. They are not all in position to be able to do that. Um, from a purchasing standpoint, um, we're going to, number one, have an improvement in internal controls and that whole authorization process. That was something that uh, we discussed with uh, uh, the uh, Mr. Geertsen, the Director of Administration, uh, certainly felt that we had better internal controls. Uh, we had the ability to know exactly uh, almost on a daily basis when something was spent and, and what it was out there. You don't have where someone's spending money and they don't have, you don't know about the bill coming in. So there are better controls from that standpoint. We're also going to save money due to uh, reductions in printing uh, paper checks and postage and handling and all those various different things. And finally, like credit cards, we're going to uh, receive rebates for those purchases. Uh, this is... Uh, certainly a, a move to the current technology. Uh, it makes our accounting more efficient and better uh, and allows us to have the internal controls while having some savings. I commend uh, Carol O'Neill, who is the Director of Purchasing, for bringing this forward, and she is here to answer any questions. Thank you, Supervisor Clark. Supervisor Noble. Uh, thank you. Um, sometimes reconciling a credit card can be quite difficult and uh, I was wondering if we've actually had the opportunity to review the reconciliation of the transactions and, and, the, the, and it says here that it integrates into the existing J.D. Edwards. Have we actually seen a uh, demonstration of that? Or has staff seen a demonstration of that? You're asking that question of who, Supervisor? Probably uh, Ms. O'Neill. Ms. O'Neill? Yeah, if you could, could, Carol, could you go to the mic? Thank you. We have seen that. We've tested it. We're in the processing of continuing to test it. We have very strict procedures in place for how it's going to be done. So every single transaction will be scrutinized. It, we don't have a, a worry about uh, whether or not it's going to, going to be um, reviewed every time. So every purchase that goes on the card will be reviewed, and we have those procedures in place. Are you confident that the reviewing process is going to be uh, quick and easy as opposed to possibly sometimes it, I found it to take longer to review a credit card than it would have been if you just didn't bother getting the rebate and paid for it the old-fashioned way? No, I think it will be as quick, if not quicker, than what we're currently doing. Um, we are still requiring people to keep their receipts and turn them in until we have um, an imaging, uh, document imaging process in place, which will be coming up within the next couple of months. Once that's in place, people will scan their, their invoices and we will just have to click on them on the, on the uh, website in order to view them. It won't be as cumbersome as having to turn in paper invoices and have everyone go through the paper. And a question with regards to the rebates, do we have controls in place so that we are 
positive that the county is going to get any rebates or point systems or uh, whatever there are as opposed to the actual user of the card getting the point or being able to use the points or the rebates? Absolutely. That's it, uh, addressed in our policy that uh, no one is allowed to use any personal um, incentive program in order to benefit from the, uh, themselves personally by this. The rebate that comes from the card company is a check that comes annually direct from the, uh, the card company to the county. But an individual isn't allowed to, say, go out to Best Buy and use their Best Buy incentive program and then gain personal uh, advantages over that. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Supervisor Noble. Any other supervisor comments? Supervisor Clark. Uh, Ms. O'Neill, can, can you just speak to the some of the other counties that are out there that are using this, the potential for the rebate? Yes. Um, the, we are part of a group called the Value Purchasing Consortium, and uh, Value is a, a consortium of municipalities and uh, educational uh, uh, unified school districts in southeastern Wisconsin. Um, we pool our resources, we pool our needs, and we do, do competitive bids as a group. Uh, value group did this uh, bid for a P card program a number of years ago, and there are uh, many different counties and school districts that are on there right now. Um, some of these counties aggressively pursue the rebate. Waukesha County um, is probably the one that most aggressively pursues it. Their annual charge volume last year exceeded $5 million, and they received a $70,000 rebate. Now that's over and above the savings that they would that they recognized from not having to print checks and use the postage and and um, um, the staff time that it involves to, to process all those checks. So they'll send one check to the car company or, or 12 checks, one monthly check to the card company, as opposed to thousands of checks to all of the different vendors that we have in our system. So um, we have a not only an opportunity here to uh, save staff time, but we also have this opportunity to get this rebate. Thank you. Thank you. Supervisor Grady. Yeah, so through the chair to Ms. O'Neill, um, you know, it sounds like a good plan. It sounds like it's efficient and so forth. You know, some of these things do have potential downsides. I don't know what they would be. Could you enumerate or foresee any potential downside with us? Uh, the only downside that I see is if we ha have the uh, incident where someone may violate a policy, but we are having strict audit procedures in place. We are going to be auditing every transaction. Um, everyone is going to be scrutinized. So if we have any problem with no one or with someone not uh, following the policy, the card will be pulled immediately. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Ms. O'Neill, are we exposed to any additional potential fraud internally than we would have otherwise. You just mentioned policy and potential for fraud. Are we exposing ourselves in any greater detail here? I don't believe that we are, are exposing ourselves to any greater fraud than what we have with the, the current system that we have in place. Um, you know, when using a credit card, you do have some problems uh, occasionally on the internet. You've all heard how you have to protect your own card numbers. People have to be very cognizant of that when they're using the card. They have to protect it as they would their own personal card. Um, there have been minor instances of fraud for the counties and the, the school districts that have used this program. Um, it's been minimal. I think the greatest amount was $1,000 is my understanding. Thank you. Supervisor Elverman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> I have a little experience with this being a a small business and having some corporate cards. Uh, one is knowing that as an individual, you have definite protection uh, in using a credit card. Uh, I've had a, uh, a time where uh, a card was used, the card number was used in Germany uh, to buy clocks. And I was totally covered, totally reimbursed, uh, changes made. Uh, to my personal account. A corporate account doesn't have those luxuries. A corporate account uh, is uh, totally vulnerable. And uh, my question would be, when I say vulnerable, that means that if it's Citibank, no matter who it is, if you're, it's a corporate credit card, 
you are responsible for every action taken on it. There is no reimbursement. Uh, uh, so my question would be, are the cards that we're going to be using a government card different than a corporate card, and has that been addressed? It has been addressed. There is a, a slight difference in it. We, we have some vulnerability, like you mentioned. Um, as I said before, it is a MasterCard program. They have a, a, a lot of tracking um, in place. They are very cognizant of the fact that people have issues with this, and they have a very strong uh, program in place to protect us. Um, we haven't run into any issue. When I say we, I mean the, the value group as a whole. They've been very comfortable with it and haven't experienced a big problem with it. This is a follow-up question then, Mr. Chairman. When you say they have a program, um, <coughs> does that mean uh, different than what I've experienced with corporate <coughs> cards that they will reimburse or they won't reimburse because in a, in a corporate setting they will not reimburse zero. So have we been told, when you say they have safeguards in place, are those safeguards something that also has some reimbursement or are they just safeguards? They do not have reimbursement, no. Well, I can address that. Uh, and I think chairman of the previous chairman of the county board has a similar experience. When I took over as chairman, I was provided with a county credit card, which I put into a drawer at home and never took it out and re recently received a $1,600 plus or minus charge for a uh, purchase in Indiana of which they claim the card was there and I can tell you I'm not even sure I signed the card to be quite honest with you. Long story short, we have been reimbursed for that. Uh, I have proof that I wasn't in Indiana. And I believe the chairman of the county board was hit with something similar la over during his tenure. The one time the card was used, he didn't use it, it was used somewhere else. So we were, in fact, reimbursed for both. There are, and my only point is, obviously, there's some safeguards. I have since gotten rid of the card. We will no longer issue that card. It doesn't sound like we'll have to under the new program either. Uh, so there must be something in place that uh, provides the reimbursement for fraud. Well, Mr. Chairman, I had the same card when I was chairman, and I was in Indiana. <laughs> <laughs> That was, that was the first thing I mentioned, by the way. They'll be right. calling you. <laughs> <laughs> Supervisor O'Day. To the Chair Carroll, how many people are going to have the procurement cards? Uh, we are planning on going at this very slowly. We have a beta test group that consists of the purchasing division, the IT division, and the UW Extension office. Um, initially, I will hold a card for every department so that I can make the purchases that I have to make. Um, it has been my experience over the last few years that I cannot make a lot of purchases that I need to make anymore without a credit card. And because of that, I have been forced on occasion to use my personal credit card and be reimbursed, which, um, you know, when it's a smaller purchase, I don't mind doing that. I really don't want to put uh, a larger purchase on my personal credit card. but. Um, we will be, w when we use this, when we use the, the card for uh, the county use, though, we will be able to um, have our, our strict um, policies in place that are going to protect us. I, I, I know that that's been an issue. Um, we were going to just have the beta test group, and according to our policy, we will go department by department and uh, progress out that way. It'll be up to the department or division head who they want to have a card. We're only probably going to do one or two cards per office. Anything else, Supervisor O'Day? Thank you. Anyone else wishing to speak? Seeing no lights, I would simply say that uh, uh, Ms. O'Neill, I think Year over year, you've brought something forward that streamlines and improves your department. I appreciate it. I think this is a program that uh, will afford us some additional safeguards and, and uh, ideally save us some money and, and provide a little bit of a return for us. So I appreciate the effort. All those in favor of policy resolution one, signify by saying aye. aye. Those opposed? Resolution carries. Approval of the October 19, 2010 by Supervisor Singer. Supervisor Singer. Move to approve uh, the minutes for October 19, 2010. By Supervisor Singer, seconded by Supervisor Decker. 
All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed? I will entertain a motion to adjourn Sendai. Supervisor Clark, seconded by Supervisor Michael. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed? We are adjourned Sendai. We will immediately go into our now annual meeting. Call the annual meeting to order. Recognize uh, 28 supervisors are in attendance. And once again, citizen comments. Any citizen wishing to address the board? One more time, citizen comments. Seeing none, citizen comments are closed. Announcements <coughs> of the chairman, I have none. Clerk. County executive appointments. Dr. Thomas Radmer to serve on the Kenosha County Civil Service Commission. Refer to judiciary and law. Pat Patricia Johnson to serve on the Kenosha County Library System Board. Refer to finance. Nancy Kemp to serve on the Kenosha County Library System Board. Nancy Kemp referred to finance as well. Susan Fennell to serve on the Kenosha County Aging and Disability Resource Center Board. Refer to Human Services. Ann Burgo to serve on the Kenosha County Board of Administrative Appeals. Also Human Services. Sandra Basiglia to serve on the Kenosha County Human Service Board. And finally refer to Human Services Committee. New business ordinance first reading to required from Supervisor Rob Zerbon and Judiciary and Law Committee on ordinance to repeal and recreate section 9.101.123 of the Kenosha County ordinances prohibiting smoking in public places and places of employment. From Highway and Parks Committee regarding repeal and recreate an ordinance on parking regulations on County Trunk Highway V from 216th Avenue to 224th Avenue. From Supervisor Joseph Clark and Administration and Judiciary and Law Committees, an ordinance to amend 4.114B of the Civil Service Ordinance. Policy resolution, first reading to required from Finance Committee regarding 2011 Kenosha County Budget. Resolutions, one reading, 73 from the Finance Committee, a resolution accepting Wisconsin Community Development Block Grant Emergency Assistance Program. Amendment, award amendment number three. From finance, Clark, yes. O'Day, yes. Jeff Gens, yes. Singer, yes. Akronis, yes. Supervisor Clark. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I move resolution number 73. Resolution 73, moved by Supervisor Clark. Bear with me for one second. Singer. Second by Supervisor O'Day, Supervisor Clark. Okay. Uh, resolution 73 is a resolution to essentially accept more money that has been awarded to Kenosha County from the uh, uh, Wisconsin Community Development Black Grant for emergency assistance. Uh, as you recall, or, um, we have uh, when we have flooded houses on the west end of the county, uh, in the past we've received dollars to purchase those homes and get them out of the floodplain. This uh, grant, I believe, also allows those dollars to be used countywide. The money can be spent anywhere in Kenosha County, including the city of Kenosha. So this uh, has no impact on the levy. We are accepting money to purchase homes, and I believe we have a list of homes out there that meet the criteria today. So I urge uh, your unanimous support. Thank, Thank you. you, Supervisor Clark. Anyone else on the question? If not, I will uh, ask for a roll call. If you're in favor of resolution 73, you're P and plus, opposed P and minus. Motion carries 28 to zero. Resolution 74 from Judiciary and Law Enforcement Committee regarding regular cabaret license for state line in. Michaels, yes. Haas, yes. Johnson, excuse. David Singer, yes. Ron Frederick, yes. Uh, Supervisor Johnson, Ron Johnson, did I, did I miss a question you had on the previous issue? Do you have your light on? All right. Okay. Just making sure I didn't uh, shortchange you on the previous discussion. Supervisor Michael. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I move resolution number 74. 74, moved by Supervisor Michael, seconded by Supervisor Haas. Supervisor Michael. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, this is basically con converting the uh, probationary license, probationary cabaret license into a regular cabaret license for a state line um, in located at 12725 Antioch Road in Trever, Wisconsin. Um, as attached, um, it had been inspected. It passed all its uh, 
inspections by the Kenosha uh, Sheriff's Department. Um, I urge your support uh, on this uh, resolution. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Michael. Any supervisor wishing to speak? If not, all those in favor signify by saying aye. aye. Those opposed? Motion carries. Supervisor Clark? Before you go to the next thing and we adjourn too quickly, I just want to again make the announcement. If you leave your, your budget book on your desk in the yellow pages, they will be inserted so when you come tomorrow, it will be intact. Thank you. And, and along with that, uh, I know we started early this evening, 7 o'clock. Tomorrow is our normal time, 7.30. 730, 730, 730. <laughs> what? <laughs> All right, we're going to be a few supervisors short tomorrow. <laughs> Clerk. Communications from Georgie Melcher, Director of Planning and Development regarding future rezoning. And refer to uh, land use. And adjourn. Motion to adjourn. By Supervisor Grady, second by Supervisor Zurban. All those in favor signify by saying aye. aye. Those opposed, thank you all. That was like the best reading.